you all uh, for joining us here at the Institute for the Study of War this morning. My name is Kim Kayim. I'm the president of ISW. Uh, ISW is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that is dedicated uh, to ensuring that uh, folks in government, whether they are civilians or whether they are in the military, um, our leaders, our thought leaders, have the best possible information about the on-the-ground uh, situation in combat zones uh, in order to help them formulate strategic decisions that are consistent with the facts on the ground. So to begin, ISIS is a religious organization. It is pursuing a political goal to establish an Islamic caliphate that rests within its own sovereign territory. They have a grand strategy. It is coherent. It is already demonstrated. Uh, it depends upon military superiority to wrest control of terrain from modern states. We are already seeing this in Syria. We are already seeing this in Iraq. And we need to understand that that is actually what it is that they're trying to bring about. It is not just rhetoric. It is based upon military capacity to pursue this goal. I'm dialing us back in time so that we understand that what has just happened is not a flash. Mosul did not just fall because something just went serendipitously right for ISIS. ISIS has also been developing, been developing its capability, regenerating its core leadership, reforming <clears throat> its strategy, reforming an institution that reminds me very much of an army over the course of several years, and that their campaign, particularly in Iraq, has been very controlled has been proceeding along identifiable phases, and this is actually very much on track with a campaign that is not done yet. Circling back on what it is that we saw the organization demonstrate over the last two years, there's another key point I want to make. This is a terrorist organization. It is still delivering terrorist attacks. This organization is also capable of guerrilla-style warfare. It is also capable of conventional warfare. Having that range means that they can prosecute hybridized warfare, which makes it actually very difficult to imagine what the strategy needs to be in order to retake Mosul, in order for Syrians to retake Raqqa. Nothing short of that is going to preserve Iraq and Syria against the threat of an Islamic caliphate that is going to consolidate and defend territory that includes those cities and potentially others. I interpret, among other things, that the declaration of the Islamic Caliphate removes barriers that constrain ISIS to Iraq and Syria. I do expect that ISIS is going to pose a genuine threat to Lebanon <coughs> and to Jordan and to other states in the region, and that their ambition is not locally bound. I take the first interest and ask myself, so what are the objectives relative to this first main security interest? I think there are four. Uh, first is to assist the Iraqi Special Operations Forces, which are pretty capable still, in conducting direct action raids against ISIS, uh, networks, facilities, and personnel. Second, I think uh, our objective should be assist the Iraqi Security Forces, and by that I primarily mean uh, Iraqi Army and Federal Police, even though we use ISF as a umbrella term, they're two separate entities, to assist the ISF in planning and executing a counteroffensive to reestablish the Iraqi border. Uh, third, of course, to uh, protect and sustain U.S. personnel. And then uh, last, to support the Iraqis who are resisting or who want to resist uh, ISIS control. So the main security uh, uh, interest and four objectives. Uh, these are uh, great points, and uh, it's important for uh, me, for me to say as well that uh, the political solution will be needed. However, the developments on the ground are moving very fast, and there has to be uh, thinking about uh, accelerating a military solution uh, in Iraq. And uh, significantly, there has to be uh, an understanding that uh, Iraqi politics is uh, slow, it's a machine, it's a big machine, and I love, uh, I love studying it, but it's a slow-moving machine. That's not going to, uh, to resolve this Sunday as uh, is, is expected or even this week. Therefore, a military, uh, military solution has to be accelerated by, uh, by those who want to 
change the situation on the ground. Okay. So this is a textured problem. I do not wish to oversimplify it. But what I also wish to describe is that ISIS brought this about in Iraq on purpose and that it is still very much an ISIS-driven problem. And the more that this becomes a sectarian uh, civil war, an ethno-sectarian civil war in Iraq, the stronger ISIS becomes and the more capable they are to emerge as the sovereign and defendable polity at the end of this. For countering ISIS, uh, for those of you familiar with the history of the last 10 years in Iraq, a uh, key component of defeating uh, AQI, uh, ISIS's predecessor in, in Iraq back in 2006 and 2007, was the mobilization of the Iraqi Sunni tribes in Amba province, in uh, Salah al -Din, and uh, other areas. Uh, for this, for this particular challenge, how do you how do you think the Iraqi Sunni tribes should be integrated within an ISF structure or as a counter ISIS force? Well, uh, <clears throat> of course, it was hard last time mm -hmm. uh, to use the, the Sunni tribes uh, as part of the uh, counteroffensive campaign to defeat uh, al-Qaeda. It'll be harder this time. Uh, the trust level, not very high. Uh, you know, we uh, helped mobilize them once. We helped integrate them into Iraqi security forces or as government structure once. And uh, then things didn't work out. Just leave it that way. So uh, they're not going to be immediately mm -hmm. uh, smiling when, when, uh, uh, when, we, when we return. Now, that said, they don't want to live under the, uh, ISIS type government either. Mm -hmm. So there is an opportunity. Jessica, you mentioned uh, the contiguous theater for ISIS between uh, Iraq and Syria. Um, uh, there's a very simple question. Can you, can you defeat ISIS in Iraq without targeting its bases in Syria? No, I do not think you can defeat ISIS by targeting them only on the Iraq side. Uh, I do think, however, that if you target them and you eliminate their presence in urban centers and major support zones on the Iraq side, you may give Iraq a chance. I think ISIS is going to go for bases. There are three bases that I think are vulnerable, and I think ISIS uh, is going to target them. On the northern side of Baghdad, we have Balad and Taji, and on the immediate southwest side of Baghdad, we have the International Airport. I think all three of those facilities are ones that ISIS could target uh, with direct fire, with indirect fire, with ground forces, or in some combination, which is how we saw the prison breaks occur a year and a year and a half ago, uh, in order to take on the Iraqi security forces directly. I can also see ISIS going for fortified targets that represent the seat of government in Baghdad, and I'm therefore very concerned about ISIS uh, tactical uh, approaches that can make the green zone vulnerable. I no, I think they want to turn Baghdad into a war zone, but to deny it as a seat of government, to deny it as a protected capital, and to deny it as a perceptually Shia capital. What, uh, what we have seen, and uh, uh, this is through our research over the last year, year and a half, is uh, on one hand, the ISF doesn't have good intelligence, especially on individuals. On the other hand, ISIS has very good intelligence. They, ISIS very much knows who is influential in every area, and they go at, it goes after that individual. And there have been many cases to, to prove it. So it's a, it's a major gap for the Iraq security forces. But what do you think are the long-term consequences of, uh, of that development, of the Iraq Shia militias fully integrated with ISIS? Well, uh, in the near term, they may be helpful in stemming the offense and providing some additional forces for the uh, at the local counterattack, but in the long run, my view is this is uh, not a helpful development. First, uh, for any state to have two separate security, official and unofficial security, this is not a good thing for a state. Uh, so I think you know that's got to factor into it. Second, uh, the probability of uh, a spiral into worse sectarian uh, violence mm -hmm. goes increases mm -hmm. the more uh, militias are thrown into the thrown into the mix. So I don't see, the, see this as a, a positive development, even if in the near term it's helpful. Thank you. So shortly, I agree. I don't think we've seen all of that story play out yet. 
I think there is more than one calculus at play. But I also see that the strongest and most capable and most organized military force that is driving this whole train is still ISIS. And I don't see there being a competition at the operational level that would be meaningful against ISIS forming at the tribal level, at the Ba'athist organizational level, at a Sunni resistance level, or at the Iraqi state level that effectively integrates any of these as part of a joint effort to counter ISIS. Okay. However, uh, I do not think that it is all that extraordinary when we see Western foreign fighters uh, displayed in ISIS social media, when we see their formal periodicals, they're putting out English language magazines regularly now, they put out the Declaration of the Caliphate in multiple languages, messaging back to potential foreign fighters in the West to encourage them to come and be a part of a movement. And I would actually describe that that is a pretty significant step change in the messaging. It's not just come and fight and be a martyr. It's come and live in Raqqa.